Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome uh, all of you to this brilliant session that we are going to have right now. And I am very, very fortunate to start with uh, these introductions. I am just going to mention this in Spanish and then we'll get back in English because we have uh, Mark Smiley and we are going to speak in English, but I will just make some introduction and, and instructions in Spanish. Eh, muy buenos días. Eh, voy a proceder a presentar a Mark en inglés eh, porque él habla inglés además de neerlandés y quisiera comentarles que no se preocupen porque la sesión que vamos a presentar ya está subtitulada. Eh, tenemos ya el video de Mark y eh, tiene subtítulos, entonces no se preocupen, todos, todas sus preguntas también las pueden ir mandando en español y posteriormente regresaremos al inglés. Well, I am getting back again on, 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 on in English. So I am thrilled to, to be here with uh, Mark Smalley. I, I am going to give you a, 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 a very, very small introduction about him because I, have, I am very fortunate because I have been able to, to, to work and to see and to speak along Mark in several places across the globe. So uh, there is a lot of, 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 of things to say about Mark, but well, Mark is a content architect at Giarte, IT management consultant at Small, a small A, IT, and master training for, uh, for Gaming Works. A lot of you in Latin America knows uh, Gaming Works. So uh, he is a master trainer on the Phoenix Project and Marslander Business Simulations. He is as well a contributor uh, to a lot of bodies of knowledge, such as a a ASL, BISL, BRM, COVID, DevOps, IT for IT, IT, very SM, and XLA. Uh, across Latin America, we are very used to see some of these frameworks. So I want to tell you that Mark is a, a, a very, very experienced uh, uh, author, co author, contributor, reader, and a master trainer on all of this. He's a lead editor of the IT for a high velocity IT book. Uh, well, Mark has spoken at hundreds of events in more than 30 countries. And right now, we are very, very fortunate to have Mark on DEX20 Latin. Mark, thank you so much and welcome to this conference. Thank you so much. Of course, it would have been even better to be with you in person, but I guess we've got to, uh, we've got to wait a little for that. Anyway, this looks pretty good to me. You've, got, you've organized a, a very nice event. It's a privilege to be able to contribute the, um, the recent knowledge that we've acquired around this high velocity IT stuff. And as you say, we've pre-recorded the presentation to give you, um, give you the subtitles. So let's, let's start the presentation. Thank you so much for joining me uh, to take a look at this new ITIL for high velocity IT module. Uh, for which I was the lead editor. It's a book that I'm really, uh, really keen on, uh, but it's a strange book. It's a very strange book. I've put some content in there which you would not normally expect in an idle book, which is why I call this presentation It's Idle Jim, but not as we know it. Uh, nevertheless, I think it's, uh, it's guidance that matters for people like us who care about these kind of things. And it was certainly, certainly written by people who care about these kind of things because I've witnessed the commitment and even love of the, the co-authors um, who contributed to this book. It's great, to, it's great to see so many people enthusiastic about writing this book. You can see my contact details uh, bottom left here. Please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or by email or whatever. I'm more than happy to continue this conversation after the presentation. I wish I could be with you, but unfortunately I can't. Uh, nevertheless, I'd like to ask you, how are you feeling? Um, and I have two questions for you, just to think about what's your energy uh, level at the moment? Are you full of energy? Uh, or did you not sleep well? Uh, have you eaten recently? Just think about your energy level. And think also about, are you feeling positive or are you feeling negative about life at this moment? Where are you on this graph? Uh, because that will determine how you participate 
in this presentation how you listen how you how you watch so just think about your feelings i think uh, this is something by the way something you could do in meetings to start a meeting just recognize that people are human beings they have good days and bad days and it's good to know uh, good to, good to good to know where people are and good to know where you are as well as an individual the agenda for this talk pretty simple so what what now what so what What's the relevance of high velocity IT for you? Why should you be interested? What are we talking about? I'll give you three examples of the content of the book. And then now what? Uh, which practical steps could you take? So let's have a look at the uh, the so what first. Um, I'd like to position it uh, firstly within the whole ITIL4 uh, concept. You've probably seen this this diagram of the certification scheme with high velocity IT as one of the modules. I think just some observations on the high on the ITIL 4 in general before we start. There's there's some for, for me some significant differences with previous versions of ITIL. The concept of co-creation of value is key. That's that intricate even intimate dance between provider and consumer where value is co-created. You don't deliver value to your consumers. It's something that you do together. It's a key thing. You'll find that across all of all of uh, ITIL 4. Uh, what you'll also see increasingly is the recognition of exploratory ways of working. So not just the confirmatory project plans and rigid processes where you know more or less what will happen, but in times of uncertainty, you have to experiment. And ITIL 4 recognizes that. Some things you have to take step by step because things are ambiguous, things are uncertain. The third topic I'd like to mention in ITIL 4 is the recognition of adjacent domains such as the Agile community, DevOps, with whom we interact and by whom we can be inspired to do things differently. You'll see lots of references to Lean Agile and DevOps in uh, in ITIL 4 and in high velocity IT in particular. Now this this was in previous versions of ITIL, but people did think did tend to focus very much on process. Um, we like to reinforce that process is just one of the constructs that you have um, available for you to to construct IT service management. So it's just one of the constructs. There are other constructs as well. Finally, the concept of value stream centricity. The value stream is where the interaction, where the action happens, where resources interact with each other, where people do things. And that is really, uh, really what we should focus on, that end-to-end -end value stream where value gets, uh, gets co-created. These are some observations which are, uh, I think my personal, personal observations about how ITIL4 has changed for the better. I like to position high velocity IT across the other modules rather than next to because the content in high velocity IT is is similar to stuff you'll come across in create deliver and support but from a more digitally enabled perspective um, so it's a it's a slightly it's a slightly different kind of book in the sense that it looks at the other books from a different perspective the rationale behind High Velocity IT, why did Axelos, the owners of ITIL, why did Axelos want this book? I think they recognise that things are changing and the, that IT service management is under pressure in many ways. Uh, firstly, the value of technology. Technology is more important to organisations, so it places higher demands on the IT. Uh, the complexity of systems is increasing, which is making it more difficult because you can't predict always what will happen. So that's the second, uh, second driver, second force on, on IT service management that I see. The third one is that uh, there is technological process, things like uh, platform as a service, um, infrastructure as code, chatbots, for instance, as a, as a manifestation of machine learning. And finally, 
acknowledging that new ways of working such as Agile and DevOps are putting pressure on IT service management, so there's a need to change. And this is why we came up with the concept of high velocity IT, which is to help the more digitally enabled organization um, with different ways of thinking and different ways of working. That's the, that's the idea behind high velocity IT. While writing the book from the start, I focused on the ideal reader and I even gave him a name, Ivor, Ivor Hivello. I was thinking about Ivor. Ivor is somebody who works in a traditional IT service management organization, um, probably process based, working in silos, possibly with a strong specialization of work. They're now faced with digital, with strange digital stuff, and with agile, resilient, continuous ways of working, different ways of working, new innovative ways of working, and they have to deal with these. Um, they want to remain um, relevant in the workplace. Of course, this is about survival in a sense, not IT service management, but IT survival management. They want to contribute in this new environment and crucially, they are prepared to unlearn old approaches and learn to integrate new ways of thinking, new ways of working in how they do things. So this is the, the ideal reader that I have in mind, somebody who's interested in this book. They also have some desires, some aspirations, such as centrally here, the raw uh, satisfaction of helping people get, job, get their jobs done helping the consumer, helping the customer. That's a, that's a, that's a key aspiration, um, and not to be hindered by lots of bureaucracy. They want to trust and be trusted in the workplace. They want to be able to express their opinions without fear for their position or reputation. They want to accept the inherent uh, ambiguity and uncertainty of the complex systems that we work in. They want to continually raise the bar learn and improve every day. And finally, they want to do the ethically right thing. So these aspirations, they guided me in the kind of content that I selected for the book. Now we'll get on to the book. Uh, what are we talking about? I'd like to talk about very briefly the making of the book, the writing of the book, give you a little bit of background about him, how it came across then the concept of high velocity IT and three examples, service experience, working in complex environments and ethics, three examples of the content of the book, um, which will also enable me to show you the structure of the book in terms of objectives and techniques that support them and concepts and models that support the, the way of thinking. The making of. These are six people who I came across physically in the good old days when we used to travel. Um, physically, when I was writing the book, um, I spoke with about 50 people, five zero people in total, who came from 18 different countries uh, at the start, ask, asking them, what do you think should be in the book? What, what, what relevant content uh, is there? Um, I, I wrote about half the book. The other half was writ written by 22 other authors who contributed great stuff. And I was the, I was the orchestrator trying to tie all these, all these bits and pieces together and make something coherent out of it. Um, now, I was, I was particularly pleased with the, with the diversity of the, uh, of the contributors. As you can see from this pie chart here, uh, slightly more than a third came from the IT service management domain, so it wasn't dominate, dominant, dominated by traditional IT service management thinking. About a third from the Agile and DevOps communities, and slightly less than a third from outside IT completely, such as Je Jeff Liker here, uh, bottom right on the screen, who wrote the, the bestseller, almost sold, sold a million copies, The Toyota Way, which is about management in a manufacturing environment, which is not about IT, but it does contain lessons which are relevant to us. So there's an example of somebody who's, uh, who's from the, the non-IT area. Uh, it was a very emergent process. It was quite, uh, it's quite scary from time to time, 
because I couldn't tell Axelos, the owners, uh, exactly what would be in the book. I could just reassure them that what we would come up with would be would be relevant and be coherent. And it's it's getting a nice reception. And I, if any of you have seen it, um, I hope uh, I hope that you like it as well. The concept of high velocity IT is an interesting one. It could imply that there is high velocity IT and low velocity IT. That is not the intent. Um, it's really it's on a gradient. It's on a spectrum. So you have lower velocity and higher velocity. We possibly should have called it higher velocity IT, but the name would be a bit clunky. So high velocity IT. It's for the the more digitally enabled organization. Of course, every organization uses IT to a degree. This is about the organization that really relies on IT to do things significantly differently or even do significantly different things because technology enables them to do that. Now, this, this places high demands on IT. Uh, this requires then different ways of thinking and different ways of working. And I've compiled uh, examples of these 25 techniques and nine cultural models and concepts as examples of what high velocity IT looks like. With this book, I do not want to prescribe how you should do things. I want to give you a, you could say, a, a guided tour of a high velocity IT organization pointing out things that you could do but leaving it up to you to decide what would fit your kind of organization and how would you apply that. So it's very much um, an offer to help you, but with but you're the owner. You know, it's your problem, I can't solve it. The book itself comprises three main parts. Context, ways of thinking and ways of working. What's high velocity IT in these kind of organizations? Um, which which cultural models and concepts um, affect your belief system, your way of thinking, and finally, which techniques can support your objectives. That's the, the, the main structure of the book. Still on the structure of the book, it's all, um, all clustered around the concept of a value stream, which is where people do things when thing, where things happen. I already spoke about the nine aspirational um, key behavior patterns. There are also there are nine cultural models and concepts. Uh, ethics, for instance, is an example of a, a cultural um, model. Uh, then there are 25 techniques which are more practical in their nature. 25 techniques that support five objectives that support the mission of the digitally enabled organization. And here I formulated a, a very generic mission of a digitally enabled organization. It's, it's being able to do significantly different business or significantly different operations. So either doing significantly different things or doing things significantly differently, changing your business model or changing your operating model, because technology enables you to do that. That's the nature of the, that's the importance of technology for you. And it's a good point, a good part in the presentation to point you towards the newest ITIL 4 publication, Digital and IT Strategy, because that book talks particularly, in, talks in, in uh, specifically about, um, about this area of the strategic choices that you can make to help your organization with technology. I defined five objectives that support this mission and I like to use them to try and find out where the weakest link is in organizations because that's really where you should be working. Always be working on the weakest link. The first objective is are you making valuable investments? Are you making the right choices? Are you building the right systems? Um, the right kind of functionality? Are you automating the right kind of processes in your organization? So valuable investments is the first one. Second one is, are you, are you developing the solutions quickly? Possibly using a minimum viable product concept, so doing things step by step. And when the system's built, is it resilient? 
Now, I'm deliberately, de deliberately using the word resilient rather than reliable because reliable implies that you can make fail-safe systems, which I believe you can't. Certainly not the kind of systems that we're dealing with nowadays. These systems are so complex that things will always happen. So you have to build them safe to fail, not fail safe, which is about resilience. Of course, during the life cycle of the, of the, uh, of the information system, you'll be continually um, developing functionality from time to time. Now, it's interesting to observe now that we, you see these three objectives, uh, v valuable investments de developed quickly and resilient in operations, you could say that as a provider, you've done your job. You know, you, the IT systems and services are up and running. But it's good to realize that absolutely no value has been realized until, until people use the systems, which is why I introduced the concept of co-created value which is that dance between provider and consumer where people use the system, get information out of it, for instance. It's an information system. It's about getting information. You use the information to help you take better decisions, but it's only when somebody acts on a decision that's been improved by information that you got out of that system that you've realised value. You know, if, 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 it, if nothing changes in the organisation, it was for nothing. So we have to realize this is this is a co-production. So that's the fourth objective. The fifth objective, the final one, is um, is an overarching or underlying objective. Uh, all of the above, all of those four objectives, you should be able to assure conformance to governance, risk and compliance requirements, whatever you have in your industry or your organization. So there we have five objectives which you could use to think about where the weakest link is. 25 techniques support those five objectives. I've selected five of them here. Chaos engineering, for instance, will help you make your operations more resilient. Here are 12 more. So here we have 17 of the 25. I found it difficult to put them all in, but this gives you a flavor of the kind of content you'll find in high velocity IT. And you can see a clear inspiration from the lean community, the agile community, the DevOps community. So I hope that we have learned from other, other communities. I now like to talk about service experience as an example of a technique. Typically, you'll recognize this, I'm sure, uh, we use the concepts of utility and warranty, fitness for purpose and fitness for use, to, um, to measure uh, service output. And it could be, it could be um, service in the sense of digital use of an information system, but it could also be service in the sense of interaction with human beings on the service desk, for instance. And you can come up with metrics like um, MTTR, mean time to recover service. I'm sure you'll be familiar with this. What I'd like to suggest is that we should be expanding our scope to also think about experience level agreement, uh, outcome-based metrics. On the one hand, business impact. For instance, what's the impact on productivity at work? Uh, for instance, when an, when an outage occurs, how much business productivity is lost? And, and I'd like to move it towards this area, and the service experience, what kind of an experience does the, uh, the customer and the user have? And this is something that you can measure in terms of customer satisfaction, CSAT, customer experience, SCORE, how much effort does a customer have to put into the transaction and net promoter score? Would they recommend you to their friends and family or would they advise against you? So we should be thinking about this area, I think, the, the, the pink area. Um, also, I think we should be thinking not only about the transaction which happens in time, but the overtime relationship that you have with your provider. Uh, and it's usually it boils down to trust. Do you trust their 
technical ability to do stuff? Um, do you trust their integrity? Are they uh, consistent in their performance? Do they keep their word? Do they adhere to values that appeal to you? Do they exhibit a benevolence? Do they have your interests in mind, apart from what is contract contractually agreed? You know, do they go the extra mile for you from time to time in the in the sense of give and take? And do they exhibit trust in you by doing things which which are out of their control? So these are things I think that we should be increasingly uh, thinking about, measuring and possibly putting into agreements. Now, if you want to improve your service experience, it's a good, a, a good thing to, to uh, think about empathy. And empathy comes in two flavours. There's cognitive empathy, which is rational and analytical, and there's effective or emotional empathy. Both words are used, emotional empathy, effective empathy, which is about feelings. Cognitive empathy is about understanding where the customer is in the customer journey, realising what kind of information they need at that moment, what kind of steps they could take, what kind of steps you could take, and trying to make the process a lot smoother. So it's about anticipating things. Um, again, rational, analytical, Whereas effective and emotional empathy is about feelings. It's about feeling that the customer is not satisfied, that you might, it might be appropriate to apologise for something that went wrong, to recognise that they're in a hurry to get something wrong, to get something done. So on the emotional side, uh, working on that. Uh, this, this is a talk in itself, but I just want to mention the topics of, of uh, cognitive and effective empathy so that you think about those a bit. Uh, there's a solid business case for investing in service experience because many um, uh, researchers have indicated that there's a strong correlation between employee experience and uh, the bottom line. This uh, case here, this research here that I've referenced, uh, states that if your employees are in the top quartal of their of employee experience in terms of satisfaction, you will be likely to get twice as high customer satisfaction and 25% more profit than others in that uh, in that category. And it's a good place in the presentation to mention the, uh, the existence of another module, the Drive Stakeholder Value module, the green one here, or blue one, blue-green, um, which talks about the customer journey in great detail. And that's also an excellent, uh, excellent book to help you think about the customer journey and the underlying value streams. So that was an example of a technique now on to the cultural models and concepts, which are more about the ways of thinking, the belief system that you have in IT service management. Uh, we, we have nine of them. I've clustered them more or less around the, the nine aspirational behavior patterns, but don't take the positioning too seriously. It's an approximation. You can see stuff like design thinking, lean culture, safety culture, for instance. But what I'd like to do is talk about ethics and working in complex environments. Uh, because increasingly we we are we are working in complex environments, we have to learn to deal with these. We're talking about systems, not systems in the technical sense, but oh, not only in the technical sense, but also in the organisational sense. A system being more than its parts, um, and a system coming in uh, in varying degrees of complexity. It's not either or. It's a degree of complexity, it's on a spectrum, it's on a gradient. Some systems are more complex than others. When a system is relatively uh, less complex, its behavior is predictable. Whereas when systems are highly complex, you can't predict what will happen. And in some cases, you can't even explain what will happen, what has happened, because there were so many variables. And in, in such cases, a root cause analysis is futile. You simply can't reproduce 
the kind of circumstances. It was just an, an unhappy accident. You have to recognise the nature of your system and because that determines the kind of approach which will work best. And I like to determine uh, to distinguish between two kinds of approaches, confirmatory approaches which support predictable ways of uh, ways of um, uh, predictable um, uh, systems and exploratory approaches which support less predictable, more complex systems. Slight explanation. A, predict, a confirmatory approach is an approach uh, such as writing a project plan where you know more or less what will happen. You can predict what will happen. So you can say we need these deliverables uh, at these milestones and then you execute the plan and because you could predict things, you, you just tick off the boxes. You say, you know, this happened, this happened, this happened. There are probably minor deviations, but in general, there weren't that many surprises. On the other hand, if we're talking about less predictable, more complex systems, you simply you don't know what's going to happen. It would be futile to make a project plan or to, to design a rigid process. You just not, don't know. That would only give you the illusion, the illusion of, of certainty, which is not much good. So you have to think more in terms of investigation, experimentation, exploration. So exploratory approaches where you take things step by step, small steps, because you've got your information horizon is shorter. You can't look that far in the future. So you have to take things step by step and be prepared uh, for your situation to change after each step because that's the nature of, of complex systems. You intervene in the system and things happen. So that's that recognition of ta taking things step by step. And there's a great instrument that you could use, the Kinefin sense-making framework, uh, to help you understand the nature of the system that you're in. If you haven't come across the Kinefin framework before, please take a look at it. It will make your head hurt. I'll promise you that. It's, it's quite a it's different way of thinking. It's the thing that influenced my thinking the most in my career. But it's, it's certainly worth it. it it's really, I, find, I found it liberating, this, uh, this Kinefin framework. Still on the topic of, uh, of, of complex environments and referencing Dr. Richard Cook with a fabulous paper, um, How Complex Systems Fail, it's a pretty short paper. It's not difficult to read. It's not a, not a highly academic paper. But he states that, that complex systems are intrinsically hazardous. They, they have defects in them from the start. That's the bad news. The good news is that these, most of the defects won't manifest themselves uh, in your lifetime. Or when they do, they're pretty easy to deal with. Uh, but occasionally things gang up on you and unfortunate incidents happen. This will happen from time to time. The trouble is, this has never happened before, so you don't you can't read you can't read in a book what you you don't have a script for this. And even experienced people um, don't know exactly what went wrong, but they have a gut feeling it's probably in this area. So they have to experiment that exploratory way of working that I spoke about. They have to take gambles, but they're defensible gambles. But you shouldn't blame them when things go wrong, it's because if you do, then they won't, they won't do it anymore. They won't take these risks. You have to take risks in these kind of environments. So that means working in complex environments requires a degree of psychological safety so that people feel comfortable taking defensible gambles and that they won't be blamed when things from time to time go wrong. Important topic. Also very important, which is why I selected it, the topic of ethics. Uh, increasingly, society and uh, the economy depend on technology. Think about the, the fairly recent Boeing 737 MAX uh, tragedy, where software played a crucial part. Uh, just imagine you were the software engineer who coded the software which contributed to what happened? Uh, were you aware of the possible consequences of your work? Uh, did you, and if you did, 
did you feel able to share your concerns with your colleagues and managers? Did they listen to you? Um, you know, these, these kind of topics. And this is why I asked Dave Snowden. Dave Snowden's the guy behind the Kinefin framework I just mentioned. Uh, ethics is one of his broad interests. And I asked Dave to write it, write a piece. And it's a lovely piece. I've tried to summarise it in five statements. Uh, technology, as I mentioned, has an unprecedented, unprecedented impact on society and the economy. Our actions will always have unintended consequences, positive or negative. Things will happen. Unexpected things will happen. Unfortunately, we are morally responsible as engineers, as practitioners, morally responsible for our actions. And that means that in organisations, we have to monitor the right kind of behaviour, ethical behaviour. And in the 90,000 words that was written for the High Velocity IT book, uh, one sentence I, I can always recall uh, from Dave, he said, just as organisations track the cash flow of their organisation, they should also monitor the flow of virtue through the organisation. I thought that was such a nice phrase, the flow of virtue. Are you doing the right thing? Now, this all leads, Dave, to the conclusion that, uh, that ethics belongs in the core of education of IT professionals, not just as an add-on, but in the core. And I'm pleased to say that we've now adopted it in the, in the ITIL qualification. Um, but of course, I think we all recognise it's not only about education, it's also about the values that people have, uh, the values that people are born with, and, and develop over time. But it's a, it's a topic that is, is concerning, and, and rightly so, concerning more people. Uh, so think about ethics. Now what? Well, obviously you've got to buy the books. Um, I say books, uh, plural, two books. Uh, the ITIL book, the official book, and here's a code for you. You'll get a 20% discount with code AB that the publishers uh, kindly gave me. Um, I was not only mad enough to get a t-shirt printed with a book on it, but I wrote a book about the book called Reflections on High Velocity IT, which I self-published on Amazon for about $10. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it contains a bit of the background behind the book, some extra thinking, stuff that, that didn't, didn't get into the book, uh, or, or thoughts that, did, that I developed after publication. Uh, but there's also plenty of free content available. Uh, every week I'm publishing a little bit of my book on a LinkedIn article called Here I Wrote This. So you can find some stuff there. And I've compiled lots of stuff about high velocity IT on, uh, on part of my, on the writing section of my website, smallly.it. Plenty of content there to take a look at. Now, what are you going to do? What I'd recommend you do is, uh, is think about the significance of digital technology for your organisation or for part of your organisation. How important is it? And if it's really important that you're thinking about high velocity IT, um, use the five objectives to determine where the weakest link is. Are you making the right investments? Are you developing it quickly? Is it resilient? Are you co-creating value? Um, look at the content of the book. Uh, when you see something that appeals to you, ethics for instance, that's a concern, do a bit more research on it. There are references to further research in the book and just start experimenting with it. You, you'll only discover whether this works for you and how this works for you by experimenting. So that's a, that's a recommendation and a, a good place to start I think is um, looking at the customer journey, looking at the touch points where consumer and provider interact and seeing how you can improve those uh, using the underlying value streams behind the customer journey. But before you start, you know, maybe you're enthusiastic about uh, high velocity IT, but do the other parties involved, do your business colleagues also want high velocity IT? Should they want it? Is it something that is fitting for your organisation? I must emphasise 
Again, it's not about high is good and low is bad. It's about finding the right degree of velocity that suits you. So work that out first. Uh, think about your relationship with your business colleagues. D do they trust you? Do you trust them? Do you have a good a good basis for uh, for a um, an improvement initiative such as this? You know, if you've still got problems with the service desk, then it's not likely that they'll want to do this with you yet. So get the get the basics sorted first. Consider seriously how much cultural change you can absorb in your organization. This could, depending on how you do it, this could shake things up quite a lot. So be realistic about how ambitious you should be. Uh, choose, an choose a realistic ambi ambition level. Uh, and a final thought is um, typically, and certainly if you're making a big investment, big change, your performance will dip slightly before it increases. Are you prepared to accept that dip? So manage expectations about what people should uh, should expect. Which leads me to, uh, to the final uh, assertion that I'd like to make, is that if digital is a significant enabler for your organization or part of your organization, and if you're willing and able to rethink uh, or reconstruct your way of working, then I think High Velocity IT helps you uh, discover what you need. I think it's a great place to start your thinking about High Velocity IT, but a terrible place to stop. Um, I would like to emphasise that it's, it's, it's guidance for matters for people like us who care. So with those thoughts, I'd like to ask you, how are you feeling now? How's your, are you exhausted? I'm sorry I've, put, I've given you so much content to think about. I hope it hasn't exhausted you. And I hope you're feeling a little bit positive about it, even if you're exhausted. So just think about your feelings. Um, and, um, and now I'm more than happy to take your, take your questions. Thank you so much for your, for your interest. Thank you so much, uh, Mark. That was an awesome, a brilliant presentation. Uh, please remember that you can start sending your uh, your questions. So I will start. Uh, yeah. Well, some 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 comments about wonderful talk and appreciating your your talk, Mark. So I will I would like to start with the first question, Mark. Uh, you know we have been. Since uh, we launched uh, ITIL4, I think that it is already two years ago, right? Mm. Yeah, from, from foundations. And since we announced that, okay, there, is, there are going to be several publications. And, 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 and I can uh, tell you that at least in Latin America, one of the most expected publications to come out, it was about high velocity IT. It is, you know, when, 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 when we are working uh, throughout uh, IT, we know that this is something that we really need. And since then, I remember that uh, some of the PP Gurus guys, consultants and myself, when we have been traveling or, or when we used to travel, <laughs> one of the main questions that, that, that we got is that, okay, that sounds amazing. Uh, I already some of the of the attendees. I am pretty sure that they already got the high velocity IT book because it was very cu uh, curious. After after getting the foundation book, they just got the high velocity IT. Uh, and one of the main question is, uh, okay, that sounds good, but um, where should I start? Because right now I have my business as usual, and I want to adapt uh, and adopt this kind of high velocity IT philosophy. But where should I start? What what would you answer to that? Yeah, it's it's always the question, isn't it? How do you how do you get started? I, as I said during the talk, I am very reluctant to prescribe how to do things, how to tell you know. So, but but I've, I'm offering some thoughts. Um, I'll repeat them very quickly. The thoughts at the end. Think about think about the. Rather than just your own department, 
think about the whole organization from end to end and try and determine where's the weakest link. And particularly the first objective, the first of those five objectives I mentioned was, are you making valuable investments? This is a fascinating topic. You know, if, if we, if I think people listening at the moment, many people will have um, implemented agile in their organizations. And if you ask them, when did you do that? They'll maybe say, well, five years ago, say 2015. But when you realize that Agile emerged, or at least the Agile Manifesto emerged in 2001, if, they've, if somebody only adopts it in 2015, you could say they've lost 14 years. It, of course, it's, it's, a, bit, it's a, bit, uh, a bit wicked to say that. But in a sense, the speed with which you come up with ideas to develop that's crucial but that's that's the bigger that's the bigger chain but just in ge in general thinking about the larger chain is your problem speed is it resilience is it co-creation of value i think that co-creation is quite an interesting topic traditionally we in it have often been satisfied by building a system getting it up and running but we're done now it's up to the user but you've got to realize that it's that it's that dance that you have to do together. I um, um, in that part about service experience, I spoke about the topic of empathy, which I think is also something we we could think about. So I just like to give people who are trying to get started in this area a couple of ideas to think about ethics. Um, uh, empathy, these kind of topics, and if it resonates with you, do a bit of thinking about with it. Do a think a bit of thinking about it and start experimenting, possibly on a small scale, just with a few colleagues in your department. Think about your your circle of control, your circle of influence, and your circle of concern. You know, keep things pretty small to start with. And if it works for you, maybe it will work for other colleagues. I saw while we were talking, I saw some some uh, some questions come in, which is yeah, great. that's 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 great, uh, Mark, because you can uh, we can link the, the last part of your answer with the following question that is, uh, in your opinion, how can we reinforce the key behaviors we want to achieve uh, by using the guiding principles? You just mentioned okay. You just should select a small, uh, a small, uh, a small group of people. How can we link this with the guiding principles? Cited for guiding principles. Yeah, the the well, I I, I did that in the book, um, in at, at a pretty high level. I think the fact the guiding principles for people who are not aware of the ITIL guiding principles, that was a, one of the best things that Axlos have come up with. I think they're really, really great, and we've we've improve them a little bit in ITIL 4. Yeah. But if you look at those kind of things, start where you are, for instance, such that's one of the guiding principles, such excellent guidance to realize that you, you work in the organization that you have. You can't just change it radically. You have to look at, and I'm referring now to that topic of working in complex environments. And what I learned from the Kinefin framework and complexity thinking, is to think in terms of moving to the adjacent possible. So zigzagging through an organization, thinking about, uh, often use the word, the disposition of the people in the organization. In which direction are they leaning? If they're enthusiastic, if you talk about reinforcing behavior or changing behavior, if you, if you think about what motivates people, try and do something in that direction. That change changing behaviors really is really tricky. Absolutely tricky topic. Yeah, and this will uh, will lead us to the next question, which is what will be a good way to approach the board of directors in order to help us to address this this paradigm? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. No, it's always uh, always a challenge. Uh, I did a, a bit of work for the DevOps Agile Skills Association. Uh, wrote a white paper called The Business Value of DevOps. 
Now, that's about DevOps, but the principles are quite universal. It's about, it addresses the difficulty that IT people often have in articulating the value of what we do to executives. So we often talk about the reliability or the resilience of, of systems. Look at the infrastructure, for instance, you make your servers more resilient. What does that mean to a director? Well, if you think about how that translates, it could mean that, the, that your website is more reliable, therefore that the customers have a better experience, therefore your customer satisfaction goes up, therefore your customer loyalty goes up as well, therefore because loyal customers usually one buy more from you and two they're often prepared to pay a slightly higher price for your services because you deliver great value so you could say improving the resilience of a server translates at the bottom line to more sales and better margins and that's the kind of that's the kind of um, mba talk that executives uh, like to hear talk about speeding up delivery for instance um uh, time to market time to time to cost you know those kind of things translated into their their terminology yeah that's right that's very important as well now we have we have people even from universities mark which i think that it's really really important in order to they they are starting to ask okay i, I really like this kind of a high velocity it how can i bring these into the universities do, 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 do I need to suggest them to start by starting uh, and certifying on IT4 foundations or, or how do you think we can bring high velocity IT into the universities? That's, that's an interesting question. I'm currently helping a group of universities, IT departments of universities in the US. They have a, a, a kind of collaboration between universities including the IT departments, and they've asked me to contribute to, uh, to an initiative where they've picked a topic, they're working on change enablement, change management as we used to call it, uh, getting things done quicker, and looking at DevOps perspectives and ITIL perspectives and comparing the two. So what they've done is they've, they've you, could, you could consider, the person who asked this question, you could sit, consider this approach, Choose a topic that's concerning you, get a group of people together and discuss it. And if and you, and maybe you, if you could you could possibly get somebody from outside to like me, I'm just offering this this guidance um, where I can get somebody from outside your organization to reflect on the thoughts. That might be a way to start things. It's, it, but it's it really it's really key to find find a concern who is concerned with this problem and, and work, work on that. Perfect. Now we have, well, uh, thanks a lot. And another question says, hi, Mark, what would be your best recommendation so that the co-creation remains active uh, while we are keeping the balance between the service provider and the customer? How can we keep this balance between co-creation? I think one of the, I'm not quite sure whether I'm interpreting the, the, the question correctly, but one, one of the things that, that really helps is, as IT people, it's about empathy as well. And I, I mentioned cognitive empathy, mm. understanding where a customer or where a user is in the customer journey. It's great if IT people can actually participate, can, can go to the user, the workplace where people, where the users work, to try and get a better understanding of what do they actually do? What are the practical problems that people run into? So make a, make a, try and make a habit of, um, of exchanging knowledge about um, you know, what, do, what are, what are the, the day-to-day -day concerns that, that users have that will certainly in, increase your, the, it will increase the relationship with the consumers as well, which is, which is always good. That's no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure whether I've interpreted this, this yeah, correctly. Yeah, that's right. But, it, yeah. but it, it is really that co-creation stuff that, that really is a key. For me, it was about, I think, five, six years ago. Um, I had a with, with what people call service science and service dominant logic. There are terms which have emerged 
uh, the past decade that really gave me a better understanding of the, the dynamics of how providers and consumers interact with each other. And that concept of co-creation is really, is really key. That's perfect. Uh, then I, I would like to interpret, uh, I, I don't know exactly if this is, a, this is what they are, they are expecting to see. That's, that's why you just feel, feel, please feel free to send the, the questions in Spanish. Do not worry, but well, this is my interpretation about this one. This is from, uh, from Gabriela, who says that what recommendations you can give us to develop, uh, she said, a research capacity, but I will say that it will be to develop a research capability on organizations in order to enable high velocity IT. What kind of recommendation do you think that we must uh, consider if we want to start researching for new stuff? You already mentioned a lot of a lot of things. That's pretty much what happens when, when, when somebody speaks with you because you know a lot of things, but you mentioned uh, Kinefin, uh, you mentioned uh, DevOps. Uh, what else do you think we need to, to start uh, researching? Yeah, yeah, listen, you know, I'm, I'm a hu human being as well. I've, I've learned this stuff just by showing some interest in topics. What I, what I have done, and this, this might be useful, if you look at my website, smallly.it, and if you look at the learning section, in the learning section, I've, I've collected lots of stuff that I find particularly interesting. And have given you links to to short papers, to presentations, to stuff like that. Um, not all of it is related to high velocity IT, but much is. And I think whether it is related to high velocity IT as it's defined in the book or not, I think there are interesting topics there that are worth taking a look at. Um, one which uh, just thinking about this because it's it's a bit of an odd topic there's a relationship therapist called esther mm. perel mm. you might have heard of her she's she's the the therapist's therapist she, you know she's really uh, really top of the class and she's got a podcast where she records uh, therapy sessions between couples a man and a, and a woman, for instance, who are having relation, relational difficulties with each other. And she records the therapy session and her observations on what happens between people are really spot on. Uh, she makes, for instance, the uh, uh, something I hear her saying a lot when people aren't communicating well, and it's often the man who's not communicating well. She asks him, do you want to listen or do you want to be right? Because you know we yeah, we often we are, yeah. we're no that's right we're we're often trying to make our point, whereas yeah. we should be listening more, and I think that even those those slightly odd topics that I've listed in the learning section on the website, um, might give you some thoughts how you can apply this to to our IT service management domain as well. Hmm. Interesting. Just, just, that's just an interesting be, view. Be be curious. Be curious. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting view. And I think that this is this is one of the key messages and one of the key outcomes that we are getting from this session. Uh, in order to move faster and move forward, then we need to work with people. It's not about technology, it is about people. So that's that's a key outcome that we are getting from, from, from this amazing session. Well, we have some 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 messages. Uh, hi, Mark, I want to thank you for allowing us all to contribute a little uh, so this great publication, we appreciate your guidance and enthusiasm. It's from Yasmin and Ariana who worked with you on this book. That's 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 amazing. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, uh, they were, we they, have... they, yeah I've got to, just got to mention them again. I, at, the, at the end of the writing process, I mentioned during the talk it was it was pretty hectic from time to time, and certainly at the end, I, that was just one of the one of the the few moments that I started to panic, and. And they, they they helped me enormously. I had a dream team from from Mexico, from Russia, from um, from Australia, and from Greece. Yeah. People who very kindly came to my rescue and, and saved the book. So that, <laughs> that, that was great. Yeah. that's why it, it is a very well uh, representative uh, book. So I think that that's one of the key successes uh, factors that, and why. It, it yeah, is, you, can, uh, you can you can see it on my bookshelf here. By the way, this uh, this book is, this book is very interesting as well. This is marketing from Seth Godin. I also mentioned that on my website in the learning section. That is fascinating. 
it's of course it's about marketing it's not about it but it yeah. is about it as well if you think about marketing this to it marketing this ah, to executives absolutely. for instance or yes. if you want to start with a small initiative and get people to enroll to join you with this initiative seth golden's got some great stuff uh, for instance people like us do things like this people like us do things like this it's it's our community the, these are the kind of things that we do join us you're one of our kind of people join us yeah he's got some he's yeah. got some great stuff that's uh, that's yeah. a wonderful book and i think that this comment will link very well with our last question because we do not want to to get uh, a, yeah. a, a too long a video uh thanks mark uh, there are a lot of benefits around high velocity it which of these will be the one that better sells or help us to sell the initiative for uh, the constant research of uh, search of new practices and new way to do, to uh, do it's, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a consultant's answer. It, it will very much depend on on your organization. What I what I would say is try and sense in your organization what are people concerned with. You could think about psychological safety, for instance. If you have teams where people seem cautious to express their opinions, that might be a good place to start. If you're in a kind of an organization that is struggling with ethical uh, dilemmas, are you doing the right thing? So it, it's, it's really, it's a case of, of trying to assess what, what fits your organization. It would be foolish of me to try and prescribe something. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's good. Hey, Mauricio, uh, this, is, this has been great. It's been uh, always good to see you again, of course, and with your community as well. The same Wonderful. Here. The same here, the same here, yeah. Mark. I, I just want to thank you. Re, I really, really, really appreciate and I am very happy for having you here in Dex20 LATAM uh, conference. There are plenty of comments are, that are still arriving and questions. Please feel free to send all of those to us or, or straight to, to Mark. You can find Mark in, 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 in social media as well. So please feel free to do that. And you know that uh, Mark can help us, can actually help us as well. To, to, to join the, 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 the team in Latin America. So if there is anything you, you consider that Mark can, can help you to do, just please feel free to ask and we will uh, redirect uh, your, your, your comments, your questions or your requests to Mark. Mark, thank you so much. I really appreciate for having you here. Great pleasure, my friend. Great pleasure indeed. Bye now. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Stay safe. Muchas gracias a todos. Hasta la próxima.